Hello everyone, welcome to a very special episode of Tales from the Wandering Scribe and Wandering Quill. Happy May the 4th everyone, yes today is May the 4th, the official Star Wars holiday, where Star Wars fans all over the world celebrate Star Wars in their own unique way, from conventions, to lightsaber duels, to community service, to creating new products, Star Wars themed, as well as sharing Star Wars inspired artwork or stories. And that is what we're going to do today. Now, many of you may not know this, but besides being a history fan, I'm also a huge Star Wars fan. I have loved Star Wars since the beginning. My introduction into Star Wars actually began with the prequel trilogy with Episode 1, The Phantom Menace. And it got even further than that with The Mandalorian Season 3. I've loved all Star Wars. The Gany Tarkovsky original Clone Wars series. The more modern Clone Wars series I'm sure a lot of people are more familiar with. As that may be their first introduction to Star Wars. As well as Star Wars Rebels. As well as other Star Wars products including the Book of Boba Fett. And the upcoming Ahsoka series. And in honor of May the 4th. I decided to take this opportunity to read to you all my own Star Wars story that I began writing back in college. Now, a little backstory about this story. So, in college, I was part of a theater group called the Society of Lightsaber Duelists. We were a performing arts club that was, as you guessed it, Star Wars inspired. And we would perform duels for venues for big celebrations. We even took part in some parades. Now, I was with them when I was doing my undergrad back in 2015. And I still have my lightsaber from those great years. Yes, we had to buy our own lightsaber. And yes, we had to create our own character. Now, the character that I created for this theater group was called Karem Sundar. He was a Mandalorian Jedi born between the years of Episode 1 and Episode 2. And, to be more precise, he is after the events of The Phantom Menace where Darth Maul dies, but a few years before the declaration of the Clone Wars. And, when I began writing this character for my theater group, I decided... Let's actually play with this character. Let's actually expand his lore a little bit more. And from here, this is where I created the story, Star Wars, Son of Mandalore. I plan to make this a trilogy and expand this character as well as meet recurring characters, many of whom are from the Legends universe. And without further ado, let us begin... Star Wars, Son of Mandalore. Every tale has a story. Every story has a beginning. Based upon the Star Wars series, follow a new Jedi, Karem Sundar, as he not only fights his way to become a Jedi, but also a battle against a rival whose past seemed entwined with his own. Follow his journey from Mandalorian outcast to Padawan of a Jedi Sentinel to a married man to finally becoming something much more, a Jinsari. In the galaxy, there are stories of legends, those whose feats define imagination. Some are remembered for ending wars, while others are known for causing them. Each planet tells tales of its deeds in hopes of inspiring a new generation. Of legends. In such cases, these legends are Jedi. And one world was blessed with the greatest of all. On a planet Mandalore, people remember the tales of Jedi Tar Vizsla. They say he was Mandalore's greatest son. And he was during his time. However, his actions would have a powerful impact and effect on a new legend. One who, from humble origins, 
would rise and become the galaxy's greatest hero. But to understand this story, one must first know Mandalore and its people. Originally the home world of the mighty Mythosaurs, it later became the planet of the multi-species cultural group known as the Mandalorians, named after the legendary conqueror of the vibrant world, Mandalore I. These new inhabitants were known for their warrior-like way of life and code of honor. Mandalore was covered in a rich natural landscape, mostly unspoiled due to its sparse sentiment and sentient population. The world was blanketed in lush vessel tree forests, dense jungles, sprawling hills, grasslands, well suited to farming, inhospitable deserts of white sands, and numerous rivers, lakes, and seas. It was also the only known world in the galaxy, except for its moon Concordia, that the Mandalorians called home. It also possessed the unique, nearly indestructible iron ore known as Beskar, an element capable of withstanding blows from even a lightsaber. An independent world by the Mandalore, the leader of the Mandalorian clans, following the tradition established by Mandalore the First, the planet of Mandalore found itself the ally and enemy of numerous galactic governments and groups throughout the years. For countless eons, these people knew nothing but war and conquest, yet that all changed after the end of the Mandalorian Wars. With such a massive blow dealt to them, many of them began to rethink their way of life. This soon gave rise to the pacifist New Mandalorian faction and began to reform Mandalore's warrior ways. They began to distance themselves from their violent past and tried to adopt a more peaceful outlook. While the Galactic Republic accepted the planet's new ruling style, not all of Mandalore was willing to give up their warrior heritage. On the planet Concordia, Mandalore's moon became the last bastion of hope for the warrior class. Though not as productive as their home planet, the moon did provide the essentials. Here the clans thrived and lived amongst one another in relative peace. However, that peace was shattered when the terrorist cell known as Death Watch arose. Their actions brought despair and violence to the clans. Their efforts soon drew the attention of the Jedi and true Mandalorians. In a massive battle on Galadran, Jedi and Mandalorian lives were lost. Both blamed each other for the outcome, and thus animosity grew between them. Thus, our story begins 18 years after that fateful battle. <clears throat> Star Wars Son of Mandalore, Chapter 1 Work, you piece of junk! Can I kick the generator once more? It had been damaged during a recent storm. His camp was already in shambles and recently had his backup stolen by scavengers. He could not afford to lose this one too. Kneeling, he removed the back cover and tinkered at the wiring again. Now many would ask why a young boy would be living on his own. Karam looked like any other young Mandalorian child. He had brown hair, brown eyes, came from a respected family, and treated all with kindness. And yet... He was an orphan. Usually, if one was living on their own, it was because they were running from the law, chose to leave, or had been abandoned. He had the unfortunate pleasure of being born with another option. He was force sensitive. Alright, let's give it one more try. After tinkering for a few minutes, the generator gave off a loud hum and was now working once more. Getting up, the young Mando walked back to his home, a modified gauntlet fighter. It was not perfect, but it kept him safe. Opening the landing hatch, he entered the ship. Once inside, Krem was able to lay down. He had been up early trying to fix his camp. Around him was all the equipment he had scavenged from the neighboring villages. Blasters, armor, a working jetpack, helmet, fuel drives, medicine, books, and more. With the generator now working properly, Kanem was able to get out and scavenge for new supplies. 
but that would come later. Now all he wanted to do was rest. Before he could relax, he was greeted by Rusty, his only companion. Rusty was the last surviving assassin droid of the HK-50 line. When Krem found him, the poor droid was left for scraps. His only shiny Duracell plating had turned to rust, hence the name. Since being made during the Old Republic age, most of the parts were obsolete and no longer made. However, Karem made some modifications to the old droid and was able to give him a new sense of purpose, and thus made him operational once more. Since then, they've been inseparable. It helped ease the comfort of living alone. I see you notice the power is back on. The droid yellow sensors blinked in agreement. Karem chuckled and got up for a moment. Tomorrow we have to resupply. I see we go to the old camp south of here. Hopefully they have been they have working generators. Cram splashed some water on his face, drying with a towel. Rusty tapped Cram on the shoulder. Turning around, he noticed Rusty had the lightsaber in his hand. We're not starting this again. It doesn't work, believe me, I tried. Rusty gave off several whistles and beeps. You fixed it? When? In a series of whoops and whistles, Rusty told Krem that while he was busy fixing the generator, he repaired the lightsaber. Krem was in awe. For the last six years, he's been working on activating this lightsaber. Taking the weapon in hand, he began to admire its elegance. The hilt's shape was straight, rectangular, the guard protruding from both ends. The color of the metal was a darkish blue, with slight color points of gray. Igniting the weapon, he knows that the blade was thin, black in color, half a meter long, curved at the end, and emanating a white glow. He had heard stories of sabers being blue, green, and many other colors, but never had he seen a saber with a black blade. This saber must have some history tied to it. We're keeping this, Rusty, the droid joyfully whistled. As he closed his eyes, he thought of his family and his life six years ago. He remembered how simple things were back then and how it all changed in one day. Born into a small clan, he was raised by his mother, Lula Dane, and his father, Saldrain Sundar. His father came from a long line of warriors, and he wanted Krim to follow in his footsteps. Like all Mandalorian children, he was trained at a young age by his father and later a mentor or teacher. Things were going well until his sixth birthday. When he was six years old, Karem trained with a nearby boulder. His hands were swollen red and bleeding from his knuckles. His father, disappointed, began to make his way back home. Karem punched the stone into a nearby tree several feet away, destroying it in a moment of anger. Karem was shocked. When he moved his hand, the boulder followed. He was amazed. But his father was shocked. His father's ancestors fought against force wielders such as Jedi and Sith. He felt that his son's newfound gift would slander the Sundar name. Once they returned home, Sal ordered his son to pack his belongings and leave the family. Never to return. Kram was sad and confused, and his mother protested, saying that he can control and suppress his powers. But his father was a proud Mandalorian, and his pride was too great. He forced his son to leave and never come back. Karem was afraid and all alone. He didn't know where to go or what to do. He grabbed his belongings and skulked away. News soon reached the other clans about Karem's powers, and the clan leaders ordered their children not to engage with him, making Karem an outcast within the major Mandalorian families. However, there was one clan that went against his order, and that was Clan Spar. They viewed Karem's powers as a gift, when Krem was offered a chance to join Clan Spar, he refused, saying he had not proven his worth in strength or the trials. Krem's only friend out of all the clans was Akai Spar, a Zabrak female. She was a direct descendant of the famous Akavi Spar, her ancestor during the era of the Old Republic. Akai had tanned skin and green eyes, with brown hair with two ponytails in the back and several horns around her brow. Trained in using a blaster and jetpack from youth, Spar possessed few of any friends during her childhood, but quickly became one of her clan's best warriors of her generation. 
When she was only eight years old, Spar killed an abusive clan member with an improvised bomb, giving her the name Pyro amongst her clanmates. Coincidentally, that was the same nickname that Akavi Spar had when she was her age. When she wasn't training, she would make time to see Kram and spend some time with him. For Kram, having one friend was the best thing he could ever receive. He also showed him a nearby wreckage depot with materials for Kram to survive on. He transformed an old and run-down camp in the outskirts of society and turned him into his new home. He would collect worn-out technology and equipment to help give him the power to survive. And though no one would train him, he taught himself. Out of the materials he managed to find, he often found older public rifles and pistols. Is here he also found Rusty. Every day he would go out and shoot boulders for target practice to better improve his skill with a rifle, as well as his aim. Even Rusty got into the training with him. He would also train his body in the traditional hand-to-hand -hand combat art used by all Mandalorian clans. With his newfound skill in Rusty, things were getting to look much better for the young Mando for the next six years. And we're going to take a little break here, listeners. Now, the next chapter will be following up very soon. So, we will take a quick little break, and then we'll resume Son of Mandalore. 